piercing the Himalayan sky, a forbidding monolith of rock, snow, and ice. Raw, unyielding, K2, the savage mountain. More deadly than Everest, K2 seduces the best climbers on Earth. Some will reach the summit. Many will die. These are their stories. There's nothing interesting about climbing if it's a totally certain game. The, the most interesting climbs are the ones that have a huge possibility that you won't be successful. Had I tried to come down alone in the dark, I would have slipped and fallen. I'm not sure I would have survived. You've got to be prepared to accept the fact that you may be going to fail as often as you're going to succeed, maybe more often. You know, it's no, no mountain's worth a life. I mean, it just isn't. Steep as a knife blade and besieged by killer storms, K2 may be the most unforgiving wilderness on Earth. Of the hundreds who have fought to survive the summit, only a fraction have won. Among those who have stood in glory here are a handful of Americans, one of England's up-and-coming best, and teams who have learned from the mistakes of the past. Whatever the risks in getting to the summit, the odds of survival are worse on the way down. But for this rare breed of humans, the will to win can be even stronger than the will to survive. All in the quest for K2. Suddenly, uh, right in front of me, there was this prospect that included in the center this giant triangular peak rearing up into the sky. And I just froze in place looking at this thing when uh, my climbing partner came up and stood next to me. And after a few moments, I paused and turned and looked at him and said, how are we ever going to climb that thing? Climbers all know the survival odds on K2. Barely one in five expeditions succeeds without a fatality. By 1978, 59 people had stood atop Mount Everest. Only nine had conquered the more difficult mountain, K2. None of them American. Now a new American team was determined to try. The 14 members had utter confidence in both their goals. To plant their flag on the summit and to get there via the treacherous Northeast Ridge. But they started out with sobering news. A renowned British climber had just been killed by an avalanche. Byington and his crew were without peer, uh, the strongest group of high altitude mountaineers uh, in the world. And they were coming down with their tail between their legs. One of their climbers came over to me and he said, uh, you know, you're gonna find out that that's a big hill. And he paused and turned back and looked at me and he said, a bloody big hill. But it was this hill that had brought them here. And nothing was about to stop them now. The weather had other ideas. For two brutal months, the team often gained only a few feet a day, only to keep turning back. We had, uh, on our Santa K2, six storms altogether. Each of these storms were taking four, six, seven days to clear. And then we go back up and try again. We would establish one camp, just get it stockpiled, be ready to move up the mountain to the next campsite, and another storm would come in, and we'd have to go down. We were on that peak above 18,000 feet for 68 days. At this altitude, every breath was a struggle, every step exhausting. Simply staying alive became a constant battle. 
the weather cleared, only to reveal huge snow fields that could avalanche at any moment. They had to try another way. Four men had been chosen to reach the summit. The first team, Jim Wickwire and Lou Reichardt, would try to cross over to the Abruzzi Spur, the only proven route. The second team, John Ross Kelly and Rick Ridgway, got word that the bold idea was working. Ross Kelly uh, turned around and uh, said, I just heard on the radio that uh, Wickwire and Reichert uh, are on their way to the top. So I looked at John and said, so what are we gonna do? And he says, well, we're, we're going down. And I said, and give up? He goes, hell no, we're going down and traverse around the corner and follow those guys up to the summit the next day. The first team, Jim Wickwire and Lou Reichardt, were now within sight of the summit. I turned to Lou and I said, uh, you know, Lou, we've really come this far together. Let's let's go the last, the rest of the way together. And we just kind of walked uh, right side by side that last 75 feet or so to the top. After four decades of American attempts, on September 6, 1978, Lou Reichardt and Jim Wickwire became the first Americans to summit K2. On the summit, Lou was preoccupied with getting down quickly because he was cold. He, ice had formed on his beard. He wanted to stay there just uh, a minute and then be gone, down. For me, it was the culmination of this lifelong dream, and I wanted to linger. The decision to stay would cost Jim Wickwire dearly. Finally, uh, a little bit after 8 o'clock, uh, we thought we heard something outside, and we called uh, Lou, Jim, and then Lou all of a sudden stuck his head uh, in the door of our tent, and uh, it was the, the frozen man of K2. His face was sheathed in ice. Uh, and he was, start, he was shaking at that point uncontrollably, to the extent he couldn't even really complete a sentence. We said, where's Wickwire? And he said, I don't know. We said, what do you mean you don't know? And he said, uh, he's still up there somewhere. And then he said, I think he's bivouacking. We knew that uh, in all likelihood, uh, the next morning, we were, instead of being on a summit attempt on a, a body detail. The frozen night closed in around Jim Wickwire. With fierce whipping winds and temperatures below minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit, he huddled inside his only protection, a thin nylon sack. No climber in the world had ever survived a solo bivouac at that height. Alone in the uppermost region of the death zone, he clung to images of loved ones back home and silently prayed. In the morning, I remember looking up toward the summit and it was sort of a sense of, I'm here, isn't this great, uh, climb the mountain. And, and for some reason, I found that very humorous. So that's one side of your mind. The other side of your mind is these warning signals are starting to go off. If you want to see your wife and your kids again, you better get your act together. You've got to pull it together. Suffering from severe exposure and lack of oxygen and water, he struggled to keep a hold on consciousness as he staggered down the mountain. It must have been about 7 in the morning. We were going through what's called uh, the Narrows. And I glanced up, and I thought, he's frozen solid because he literally wasn't moving. And then I saw Jim slowly lift an arm and wave to John and to me, and I knew at least he was alive. As we passed, uh, the thing, one thing I vividly remember is, is John just sort of patting me on the top of my head as I went by him, and it was that, that human touch after being in that bivouac alone, uh, for so many hours that it was just, it was very emotional. Their friend had survived. Now it was John Ross Kelly and Rick Ridgway's turn to try for the top. But as they climbed higher, 
Ridgway began to suffer from lack of oxygen. Everything seemed hallucinatory. That again, it was it was all sort of dreamlike. As I was getting very close to the summit, I remember thinking that if you do get to the top of this thing, you can reward yourself with a trip to Tahiti. I told myself, listen, you do this, you get to go to Tahiti again. I had this goal, so one more step, Tahiti. And then I looked up and I could see palm trees in my mind. And they had created palm trees growing out of the snow. I was hallucinating these things. Finally, like their teammates the day before, they reached the summit and a place in American climbing history. And we just sit there on the summit next to each other, leaning one shoulder against the other, not saying anything, not even with enough energy to stand up. None of this conquering the mountain. And finally, um, John suggested that we think about getting back down. So maybe resting and breathing enough, we started to return to some semblance of rational thought. And before we walked down, I remember pausing for a minute and looking out over this, what must have been a marvelous panorama. And it was because John did take a photograph or two of it so I could admire, or both of us, admire later in our lives. And I do remember sitting there telling myself, Rick, try to appreciate this because someday, a long time from now, this is gonna seem important. In the two decades following the American triumph, a hundred more people reached K2 Summit, but nearly a third never made it back alive. K2 has become the last mountain for many top climbers. The families of mountaineers learn to live with risk. But the nature of a climber's death often of unknown circumstances and always in remote locations makes the tragedy seem less real. Alison Hargreaves' husband says he doesn't believe reports that mountaineers have seen her body. K2 is considered one of the most dangerous mountains in the world to climb. Alison Hargreaves' husband, Jim Ballard, seen here with their two children, has monitored the scraps of information Alison emanating. Alison Hargreaves pictured here three months ago after her record-breaking conquest of Everest. She climbed Everest the same year I did. And um, we'd sat in base camp together talking about all this sort of stuff, and I knew she was going straight from Everest to K2. I thought she would probably do K2, and we talked a lot about this sort of stuff. It's just the kind of conversations you have that you, know, you reassure each other by, sh by just trading experiences. Alison Hargraves was a relatively new face in the climbing world, but she had an ambitious goal, to summit the three highest peaks in the world in a single season. At 33, she had just become the first woman to climb Mount Everest without support or bottled oxygen. K2 is notorious for its sudden violent storms. Alison Hargraves knew that survival here meant not only reaching the summit, but descending quickly to stay ahead of the weather. The Killer Mountain, people call it. It's got this um, incredible aura about it. It has taken a lot of lives, but so too has Everest. I mean, on my ascent of Everest, I actually walked, literally walked past two dead bodies. Um, people are, you know, still on the mountain. People get do get killed. And it's also partly the fact that Katie does get a very much of its own microclimate. It creates an awful lot of its own storms, and that's the problem. It's people get trapped high up in the storms. So again, the trick is to, to get up and down as quickly as you can. Three weeks of storms had kept Hargraves off the mountain. Hey, what a view again. As the weeks passed, she grew homesick and told a fellow climber, I'm desperate to get the climb down and get home to my kids. I guess if we look down to the left, yep, we can see where we've come up. Finally, she began her ascent to the summit. Don't fall off now. Remember, you've got my sleeping bag under your arm. Right. 
She kept a video diary for her children. Okay, this is a real trial. <laughs> okay, I'm going to pull this out and that will go right in there. And that will just melt down. I can make some tea. And hopefully I should be ready to possibly do a summit attempt mm. after a few days rest. But we'll see. Just arrived at the shoulder. It's quarter past seven in the evening. But it's the most incredible sunset. I've uh, arrived in much, much better time than I thought. I also forgot Mashabrum somewhere. Oh yeah, that's Mashabrum. And uh, the tent. So I'm going to spend the next few hours. Uh, figure I'm leaving early morning, maybe about 3, 3.30. As the sun hits the tent, hopefully. <laughs> this is the famous shoulder. And uh, oh, let me turn around. Looking up at K2, way steeper than you think, uh, at the uh, bottleneck and uh, the summit up there. Wow, it's a long way from here. Looking forward to it. <laughs> Alison Hargraves had now joined three groups of international climbers for a final summit attempt. An unseen disaster was building. Two storms were gathering. K2 stood in the direct line of fire. The climbers trudged on. Some were beaten back by cold and fatigue. But Allison and five other climbers made the choice to continue. They seemed unaware of the brewing storm. Perhaps it was because the day was strangely calm, or because they were so close to the top. Allison Hargraves and five others made it to the summit. But their margin of safety was as narrow as the mountain's peak. Then, the monster struck. The colliding storm slammed into the mountain with hurricane winds at over 100 miles an hour. It seemed certain that the climbers were whipped up like matchsticks and literally blown away. None of their bodies has ever been So many climbers are kind of full of bluster and, and a bit of arrogance. But she was very mild-mannered and, and sort of meek about it. And when Alison got killed on K2, I, I just felt really sad. She's doing so well at this kind of high-altitude climbing that she was very good at. And uh, yeah, she got caught in that storm and died. I just felt really sad about that. Alison Hargrave's family had sent off a seasoned pro. They got back a statistic. Confronted with the majesty of K2, statistics become meaningless for passionate mountaineers. By 1996, a year after Alison Hargrave's death, K2's death toll had reached 45. In the summer of that year, a Chilean expedition came to K2. They had carefully studied the successes and failures of those who had come before them and were confident of success. None of the routes up K2 is easy but the south-southeast ridge they had chosen was considered among the safest. At home, competitors on two sports clubs, the men must now bond as one team. But each man's life depends on it. In total, there were just seven climbers, plus a physician and two photographers. Four men would climb to the summit. Two others would resupply the higher camps, giving up personal glory for the communal good of the team. In order to rest for a day, the final ascent would be at night. 
In complete silence, we headed off to the bottleneck and the traverse, which is the most difficult pass of the ascent. Each one of us immersed in our many thoughts. We had the entire night ahead of us. But darkness and plunging temperatures demanded the weight of extra equipment. As the day begins to dawn, we arrive at 8,400 meters, where we take in a spectacular sunrise. For me, this is the most emotional moment, because I am sure that nothing can stop us now. They quickly dropped their extra supplies, but the weight had already taken its toll. Fatigue swept over them. Misael tells us to go on ahead, that it is enough if just one of us reaches the summit. We tell him to keep going, that it is not much further. As I get closer to Miguel, Misael catches up to us. Little by little, the team gained the final meters. Ya llegaron todos a la cumbre, todos en la cumbre. ¿Qué tal? Cambió. At 9.15, Christian radios base camp. ¿Qué tal, weón? Impresible, de siete, cuatro en la cumbre, weón. ¿Qué tal? La raja, culiao. Puta, qué maravilla, weón. No sabí lo feliz, weón. Toda la gente acá, la raja, weón. La raja, cambio. <laughs> They raised a glass of Chilean wine in a toast at the top of the world. It is exquisite how the world looks from so high. I am a mere flicker of life, fragile and brief, standing on the summit of this colossal mountain amid this vast ocean of mountains. The men knew the dangers of lingering on K2, that others have done so and died. But wrapped in the splendor and glory, they bet against all odds. On K2, three minutes could easily be too long. They stayed more than three hours. At 2 p.m., Christian again radios base camp. Exhausted and confused, Miguel had thrown away his nearly empty oxygen tank and simply given up. La única posibilidad que veo darle harto oxígeno, cambio. Ya voy a subir con la botella, Dr. Alfonso Diaz made a difficult request. He asked Christian to climb back up the steep slopes to retrieve the oxygen tank. Then, miraculously, a second radio message arrived. Two of the team who had dropped out of sight had reached the emergency supplies more than 600 feet below Christian and Miguel. ¿Dónde están, cambio? At nearly 28,000 feet, the climbers knew it would be impossible to carry Miguel back to base camp. In a show of heroism and superhuman effort, Christian climbed more than 100 feet to retrieve Miguel's oxygen. And Misael climbed nearly 600 feet to carry water to them both. Barely escaping one man's tragedy, the entire team 
shared in their success. For me, it was meaningful to be the last to leave the mountain. I embraced my companions. Between all of us, we had climbed the mountain. There is no other mountain like this one, none more deadly, nor with more allure. All who are beckoned here count on luck, intuition, and experience to guide them. But all must take equal warning. K2 Summit is not the prize. The true triumph, and the only one, is life itself. To summit and survive.